Welcome to McDougal. Before you take that next pain pill, watch this show. Hello, I'm Wayne Judd. And now, we think of him as our very own Big Mac, Dr. John McDougal. another topic and that is how do we eat out in this world of fast food and junk it's a great question and there's a lot of junk out there you know since I adopted the uh, the healthier diet yes and cut out all animal products mm -hmm. and oils hopefully and oils yes mm, still working on that a little bit but I'll tell you what it's hard to look at a menu and find anything that looks very good well I got to be honest with you John it's I a, do it's a, a lot downside. of eating out because I do a lot of traveling Right, and uh, it's just a matter of deciding first of all that that's what you want to do. You're deciding you want to eat healthy, and of course, as you're more and more involved in the program, it, that decision is easier and easier because there's all kinds of temptations out there. So let's face it. Uh, but, but it's not you tempting. There's just nothing any good. Okay. Well, let's talk about some of the possibilities. Okay. I travel a lot, so one of the things that is in my computer data bank at my travel agency, every time my ticket information comes up, it says pure vegetarian, no oil that goes in with my ticketing. And they do that for you? The, yes, the airlines will do yeah, it? They do, and I have excellent meals. I bet people would envy what you have on your plate they when do. they see it come. They do. As a matter of fact, and it usually comes, you know, that comes coach class, but sometimes I get upgraded to first class, so they take my meal and they move it from the styrofoam onto the china plates, but it's Why the same not? meal, it's, it's great. Well, it works. You know, I, I had the, my first experience with that uh, was a recent trip to Hawaii, and uh, on the way over and on the way back, and I did it precisely the same way. I said, I don't want oils, I, I don't want any dairy products, and I actually had a very good meal. Right, and people do look at it. Quite beats, it beats the, the, the rubber fish that they're eating. Terrible next stuff. Ooh, airplane food. And then when I get to a hotel, breakfast is really easy. I always order the same things. I get hash brown potatoes cooked dry. And you just have to ask for it, and they'll do it. If they do it wrong, send it back, and they'll bring. And they'll do it again on a dry. Do they stove. even know what that means? Yeah, though, so I just tell them no oil. If they if they look at you kind of funny when you say cook dry, I put a little salsa over the top that they have it, and they often have very delicious salsa. And that makes it moist and oh, it gives, gives it lots it a of better. flavor. Sure, or sure. some ketchup. And some people like Tabasco sauce. Tabasco mm -hmm. sauce is always available. There'd be a a one steak sauce you could put over the top, or Lee mm -hmm. and Parents would be even better because that's a low sodium variety right. of steak sauce. That's the thing that I've been interested in in your program, John, is that. Uh, is that you make your food taste good. Whatever yeah. it is, by the time you get we, done with it, it's going to taste good. Yeah, we good. use all the, all the things that do taste good. Right. And uh, I'll have oatmeal and uh, put a little bit, maybe a few raisins over the top. Now, there's nothing they can do bad with oatmeal, is well, there? Well, sometimes they can make it. They can make it with uh, milk or they can make it with... Uh, oh, really? Yeah. Do they, you have to mention that? Probably yeah, not. Yeah, I do. do I you? tell them, but uh, ask them if they just make their oatmeal plain. They, you know, they usually, almost always tell you yes. Uh -huh. You could get cold cereals and you could put fruit juice over the top. Mm -hmm. I don't usually do that, but I mean, some people. It's like not that. bad. I've tried it. It yeah, works. It's very tasty. You, if you get, don't you look get at whole it. wheat toast. <laughs> you get whole wheat toast, okay. dry. You put uh, put a little jam on top. Okay. Uh, fruit, very easy to order. So there's breakfast. For Juices. It. There's then that's a lot of options. That's just breakfast. That's breakfast. Great. Now, lunch and dinner. Let's talk about them together because they're not much different. Okay. Uh, I often try vegetarian restaurants in towns that I go to, but you have to be just as careful as you would be in any other restaurant because vegetarian restaurants are loaded with cheese. Oils, mayonnaises. That's eggs, really and what salt. vegetarian means to most people. To isn't most it? people, it does. Still, so dairy you products. have to be a good consumer when you walk in there and uh, and make sure what you're getting meets the criteria you're looking for, which is starches, vegetables, and fruits, uh, no animal products, products, and no oils. I often go to steakhouses because they have salad bars. In fact, oh, there's some a of thought. the some of the more famous. In fact, there are even restaurants these days that are they're advertised as salad bars and salad and pasta bars, and those are yes. and they usually make an effort to have one oil-free option for everybody. And so they're kind of getting into this because of consumer demand. Do you talk to people in these restaurants in terms of appreciation for what they're doing or you encourage oh, them to do yeah. other things? You're kind of a crusader when you go well, in there. I always tell them how much I enjoyed it, if yeah. I did, of course. Yes, yes. And, and other consumers. Do you tell them if you don't? No, I usually you, don't. What's the not, point? Not unless it's a restaurant in my own hometown, and then I'll take the effort. Ah, to do it. of course. If I'm going to come back, I'm going to make some effort to, to change things. Sure. And then there are certain restaurants that you can pick out that make it real easy for you to adjust to this type of eating. In Italian restaurants, the Angel Hair Pasta is, uh, is it does not contain eggs. Right. And you order a marinara sauce. Marinara. And, and mm -hmm. ask them to make it without uh, any oils or any margarines, and they'll do that. You can go to Indian restaurants. Indian restaurants are noted for their vegetarian food. Wonderful And they food. often add the oil just before they bring it out to the table because if, once you put the oil in the food, it spoils faster. So they'll make up the whole dish, leave the oil out, and you just tell them, don't add the, don't add the ghee. Don't add the oil, which is the, the ghee. All right. So All you've right. got That's Indian good. foods. Uh, Chinese restaurants are very easy. You tell them you want a monk's dish, you'd like a ginger sauce. When you order a, 
brown rice. Uh, expect to have white rice with soy sauce on it. Oh, is that the way they do it? Yeah, that's Well, it. what I have heard, John, is that, in fact, you probably know about this article. It came out quite some time back, but it said that Americans eating in Chinese restaurants are getting just about as bad that's food as they eat elsewhere. They have Americanized, they have Americanized the Chinese meal plan. So you have to, again, be careful, even though right. it's a Chinese restaurant, you can't assume that it's a Chinese good vegetarian restaurant. Chinese restaurant originally was low fat. There's some suggestion for you. Another one of my favorites is Mexican food. That's very easy to do. You get a place that has whole beans. You make yourself a burrito with lettuce, tomato, and salsa and stuff. It's, it's no trouble. Rice, All you have yeah. to do, Wayne, is decide that you want to do it. Sounds good. When we come back, we're going to be talking about pain and pain management, a very important subject for everybody out there. Pain is such a common problem. We'll be back after these commercial breaks. <laughs> Learn English while you watch TV on Hello Channel. Hey, welcome back. With me we have uh, Betty Farrell, actually Dr. Betty Farrell. She's a PhD in nursing and also works as a research scientist at the City of Hope in Los Angeles. And Dr. Joshua Prager, MD, he's got so many titles but let me just go through a few. Internal medicine, anesthesiology, pain management that he's board certified in. He's director of UCLA Pain, UCLA Pain Medicine Center. He's full-time professor with uh, UCLA active staff anesthesiologist. And uh, pain, pain is your main concern, obviously, with your credentials and your, your interest. And one of, the, uh, one of the biggest criticisms that I hear today about our profession is that we're stingy on pain medicine. Is that true? Yes. And one of the things that both of us do is go around speaking to physicians because physicians are not traditionally educated in, in giving out pain medicines to make patients We were comfortable. taught, when right. I was in my medicine residency, I was taught that you had to be very careful because you're going to make this cancer patient that's going to live another three weeks an addict. Right, and that's one of the big myths because there's a, one of the things that everybody has to understand is that there's a big distinction between addiction and tolerance to medication and physical dependence on the medication. Addiction is a set of behaviors where you lie, steal, cheat, get high, mm -hmm. whereas people who take narcotics will be physically dependent on them, but somebody who takes insulin is physically dependent on that, or somebody who takes a hypertensive medication mm -hmm. is physically dependent on that. So what a common concept that people have really has to be changed, and that is that it, because somebody said just say no, it doesn't mean just say no to appropriately used medications. Do we have to work with the nursing staff this way also? Do they need to be re-educated? they get the same kind of nonsense that I got in my medical training? Sure. Actually, federal guidelines were released in the last two years, and those guidelines address this problem that you're absolutely correct, and that's the undertreatment of pain. And in fact, even the federal government has established through good research that about 80% of people with cancer in advanced stages will experience moderate to severe pain, and the vast majority of those people will be undertreated. The same thing is true with people after surgery. About 50% of the 13 million surgeries conducted a year are expected to result in pain that's not treated. And the problem is really threefold. Uh, Dr. Prager talked about physicians, but also nurses and all other health professionals share the same misconceptions. But the other component that's also equally important is patients and family members. And getting them used to the fact that this is not going to get them addicted. Right, exactly. Because they worry about it, don't they? Is it a matter of just giving more pain medicine or giving it in a, in a better way? It's definitely a matter of giving it in a better way. They, the old saying, give it when the patient needs it, mm -hmm. is really a misinterpretation because what has to be done is if somebody has pain all the time, not wait for the pain to be really bad because the patient will need more and then you get into a cycle where they take so much to get rid of the severe pain that they wind up getting a little bit high or sleepy and then they go to sleep for a while until the next dose, which could be a long time away, when they're in severe pain again. And what studies have shown is actually patients use less medication if they're medicated properly on a, a continuous basis, which will be a lower level th than this sporadic up and down. You know, my one experience, personal experience with medication, with narcotics, was when I had my appendix out about 25 years ago. And I was uh, an intern at that time. And I wanted to try, give me an opportunity to try all the different narcotics my, I was giving my patients. And I want to tell you, after 24 hours, I didn't want any more. I was just absolutely sicker from the drugs than I, than I was from the pain. That happens sometimes when we don't 
use the medicines appropriately and manage the side effects. Because all pain medicines, as all medicines, have side effects, but they can be treated. So our goal in caring for the person with pain is really not just to give them so much medicine that yes, we've relieved their pain, but we've knocked them out in the process. Well, that's how I felt, just knocked out. Just sure. But the goal should be to balance. On one hand, we want to get enough pain relief that the person's comfortable, able to sleep, able to move around. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, we want to balance issues such as nausea and sedation. Now, Dr. Prager, you had a couple of little, like, little gimmicks. Right. Well, I wouldn't call them gimmicks. gimmicks. These are serious <laughs> medical instruments. Uh, I meant instruments, okay. so I'm sorry. <laughs> Sometimes I get those confused when I, when I deal with the medical business. This is an intrathecal pump. Um, this is a little computer and what it does is it can deliver narcotics or other medications directly into the spinal fluid so that this can deliver one three hundredth of what somebody would take orally right to the receptors for the pain in the nervous system so that the patient can have pain relief without the same side effects. In cancer patients who come in in severe pain when we use this, we can take people who have so much side effects because that's how much medication they need to try to control their pain, yet they're still in pain. Give them this pump or other ways of delivering medication directly into the nervous system and have them become pain free and wake up again. Now the tube goes under the skin and into the nervous system. Does this sit on, sit on the skin or in the No, pocket? actually this sits um, right under the skin. Oh, so they surgically the implant that. Right. So how do you get more drug into that? How do you get, th there's a, a special a diaphragm right here, mm -hmm. and you put a little local that, anesthetic on the, the skin, and, the and you go right through it. And just administer more right. into The it. patient self-administers with this? No, no this, you this, do it. But the thing is, this administers such a small medicine, amount of medicine it's that it continuous. only needs to be refilled about every 90 oh, days. Oh, so it's a continuous. Goodness. You're kidding, 90 days worth of narcotic in there. Right. What do they usually put in? Morphine. Morphine. Morphine is the only one that's officially FDA approved, although doctors use other medications. Okay, and you had another uh, little instrument that uh, didn't deliver any, any drug right. at all. And this, is, this can be a miracle when it, when, in the properly selected patient. Uh, this is called a spinal cord stimulator, and it's made by the same company that makes pacemakers. And this delivers a small amount of electricity right to, right to the spinal cord to be able to trick the spinal cord in a way from perceiving the pain information that's coming in from the periphery. We can take patients, I and mean, this is actually a good way of demonstrating how the addiction myth is really a myth. Because if we put this thing in and make a patient who has severe pain, make their pain go away, then they don't need any narcotics. When we get back, I want people to know how they can, they can act as advocates for their family members and get this kind of more humane, conservative care. And we'll be back in a moment after these commercial messages. <laughs> Looking for a brighter future? Learn English and make it happen on Hello Channel. Hey Dad, can you come out and shoot some hoops with me? Busy. Studies show that by the time I'm 12, I can be influenced by friends more than parents. Give your family everything. Give them your time. Welcome back with me, Dr. Joshua Prager and Dr. Betty Farrell, and they're involved in pain management. People who have just heard what you said about uh, how to control pain better, they're, they're often in a situation where their own doctor is not using these simple techniques. Uh, their own doctor may be inadequately controlling the pain. They see suffering in their family members. It's a terrible thing. Well, do they act, ask for a consult from a, a pain specialist? Is that the way they go about doing it? Or how, how, do they get, how do they interact with their physician who may feel he or she is doing the best thing and is not and get well, the best care? For, if the primary physician is not asking about the pain, the first thing is to teach the, the physician that the patient's having pain. Uh, there's a saying in medicine, if you don't take a temperature, you don't find out that there's a mm -hmm. fever. And if you don't ask a patient about pain... And the squeaky wheel gets the grease. You, you don't find out that it's there. And so if you're, you're choosing to ignore it, it'll be ignored. So if you're working with a physician that doesn't believe in pain or doesn't believe in pain being treated, then get yourself to, to a pain specialist who knows how to treat pain. Okay, and they can ask for a referral. I mean, in big cities, there's going to be doctors there like yourself. There are pain yourself. specialists all over the country. Pain, pain specialists, and you can get this kind of... Uh, and an important consideration, so, I mean, we bring these, these are the last stage of the continuum. 
Yes. I mean, you start out with very simple methods to try to, to control pain, which may, can include changing a patient's behavior, getting the patient involved in treating their own pain. And then you go to things like um, acetaminophen, which is Tylenol, or non-steroidals, you know, aspirin, Advil, Motrin, those kind of medications. And then you start working up to the narcotics that we were talking about. Those aren't a first-line drug by any means. And you only get to this when nothing else works. Low back pain is one of the biggest yeah. problems in this country. Do you deal with that often? That's about 50% of my practice. Half your practice. Yeah. So what, how would you go about somebody who comes in with low back pain? And let's just start from somebody who's ambulant, uh, walks around right. without any problem at all, and um, go on to somebody who's uh, disabled. How, okay. would you, how would you deal with the person with that problem? Well, a person who's ambulatory and walking around, the first thing is to take a history. And mm. that's key. Find out how they sleep, how they walk, how they stand, how they lift things, what position they drive their car in, and try to modify behaviors that are exacerbating the, the pain. Um, because very often, just by conservative methods, and sometimes with physical therapy in conjunction with it, you can get the patient to control their pain, and you don't need to do anything further. And there are also a number of non-drug treatments that are very helpful, particularly for low back pain. So there are a number of other things, for example, that physical therapy can offer, the use of heat, cold, um, massage, massage, as well this as, is, this is sure. getting to really extend. How about acupuncture? Do you ever get involved in that? We have an acupuncturist working with us in the oh, pain center. Very good. Right. Very, be, very broad person. Even acupressure is a non-invasive method. So just as Dr. Prager said, if we think about pain management on a continuum and we begin with things that don't even involve medicines or drugs at all, right. things that are really physical methods or even cognitive methods, things like meaning thinking, uh, relaxation, imagery, distraction, the use of music, humor. There are a number of things that might distract you uh, from your pain. And then we move on to the drugs, but we begin with the simplest things, pain pills, uh, the non-narcotics, um, non-steroidal drugs, uh, and then we move up to the um, what we think of as the narcotics, but taken just by mouth. On the one hand, you want to get them on the minimum amount of medicine, but you also want to make sure it's adequate. And you mentioned a couple of medicines that people often think are entirely without side effects and are perfectly safe to take, like Tylenol, aspirin, non steroidal anti-inflammatory such as Advil, but that's not true, is it? These things have significant side effects so when people use them for a long right. time. Everything has a side effect that, that you would take into your body. I mean, it's a very rare drug that wouldn't. We're using now a drug called capsaicin, which comes from oh, the sure. capsicum pepper or the jalapeno pepper that actually applied to the skin can decrease something called substance P, which we now know is one of the pain transmitters in the body. That's taken externally, and that can have a little side effect too, but really not much. But if you take non-steroidal like aspirin, you always worry about stomach upset. If you take Tylenol, you can have um, you, you kidney can have problems, liver problems. Liver problems. Sure. Do you uh, do you have an objective way of understanding this pain, or do you simply go by what the patient says? And that seems a little scary. Well, actually, the patient really is the expert because pain is an extremely individual experience and two people can have the exact same situation. Two people can be in the same hospital room having had both a hip fracture or even cancer, a number of problems, the same surgery, and yet for many reasons their experience of pain will be very different. So the way that we evaluate pain is, as Dr. Prager mentioned, it's very important to talk to the patient, get information about their pain, but we start by asking the patient to rate their own pain, much like you use a thermometer so that you can judge how much temperature you have, and once you give an antibiotic to know if the temperature goes down with the thermometer, mm -hmm. we use pain rating scales and ask patients to evaluate their pain uh, on a scale, for example, of zero to 10, and then we can go back later and find out. If uh, Dr. Prager has seen the patient and has tried a, a new device or a new medicine, then we can evaluate how much did it help the patient. You know, you, when you talk about this, I feel uncomfortable. I feel inadequately trained. And I, you know, I have a very difficult time you know, dealing with the patient in an effective way, I'll be quite honest with you, even as an internist, because I haven't had this kind of education. Right. And what I've had, you know, I know, 
actually interferes with the kind of care the patient needs to have. Well, I mean, it's remarkable. I, I mean, you mentioned all the credentials. Well, mm -hmm. I went to a, a, you know, a prestigious medical school and had one lecture on pain mm -hmm. in all of medical school. It's amazing. I, I did an internal medicine residency at a major hospital and had zero lectures about pain. And then I did an anesthesia residency where you would think that that's a field that's really interested in pain. I had four lectures on pain during my whole residency in anesthesia, and they were very abstract, <laughs> not dealing with really how to get to just treating common pain. Dr. Betty Farrell and Dr. Joshua Prager are my guests, and we'll be back after these important commercial messages. Be right back. <laughs> Dr. Betty Farrell and Dr. Joshua Prager are with us, and we're talking about proper pain management, and that means not too much, but you said also not too little. I mean, we have these drugs, they're not that expensive. Right. Why be so stingy about it? Um, pain is a very significant problem, and what we need to realize is that the vast majority of pain can be relieved, and we also need to realize that when we fail to treat pain, we do a lot of harm. People who are in Suffering. pain are people who don't move uh, around. They're people who develop other medical problems, mm -hmm. people who don't sleep well or eat well, uh, and people who really experience often rehospitalization or staying in the hospital longer. So we need to all be far more aggressive about how we treat pain, and it's very important for patients and families to expect a higher level of pain relief. I think they should expect also better educated doctors and maybe maybe go to the specialist right away or as soon as they can if they're not adequately controlled. Well, we can see a vicious cycle sometimes. A patient who has a lot of pain winds up getting depressed. Mm -hmm. And when they're depressed, they experience more pain mm -hmm. than they would if they weren't depressed. And that makes their pain worse, so they get more depressed. And, and the cycle continues. And there is recent literature that's showing now that pain actually may have an effect on the immune system, so that if you can control pain, your immune function may actually be better. So, I mean, we're really talking about doing things that take care of your overall health. Dr. Prager, I can tell you like your job. I love my job. <laughs> because you do wonderful things for people, right? And you also, Dr. Farrell. Tremendous. Yeah, that's where the reward comes from. Obviously, you've, you've filled a niche that really needs to be filled and one where you can get tremendous, tremendous feedback from the patient of what a, what a wonderful intervention you've made in their lives. There's oh. nothing could be more satisfying. Nothing more satisfying. That's great. You, get, you have really shared some wonderful information with us. I want to thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. This is really, really sure. great. Thank, thank you for being yes. with us. Thank you. And thanks very much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.